know, we're heading into a season now uh, where things are going to be kind of uh, rocking and rolling, so to speak, as far as our lives go, because uh, everything's going to be happening, pointing toward the birth of Christ. At least for us, it, it'll be this way. You know, you'll be going into stores. No other time of the year do you go into stores and hear joy to the world, the Lord has come, uh, the first Noel, and, you know, uh, uh, we wish you a Merry Christmas and things like that. And I know the world doesn't really focus in on the true meaning of everything that's going on at Christmas, but, but we do, and, and we know what it means, and we know what that says to us, and we know what Christmas is all about. And as we move toward it and we get closer to it, I, I think lots of times, uh, if we're not careful, we can kind of get sidetracked with what real Christian life is about, especially during these seasons that we're in now. And it's really a very simple, and, and I put it on your outline for you this morning and basically called it the master's well done and it, it deals with, uh, with pleasing the Lord is really what it, what it deals with. It deals with uh, how can I please the Lord? Am I pleasing the Lord? What would I need to do to please the Lord? Is God pleased with me? Am, am I doing what I should do? Because when we enter seasons like this, lots of times, you know, there are emphasis on all kinds of very spiritual things going on in our lives. And we go to services that uh, are deeply spiritual and uh, reverential about Christ and about his birth. Thank you, Isaac. About his birth and about everything to do with Jesus. And, 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 and if we're not careful, you know, we can begin to beat ourselves up and abuse ourselves about our own lives and what they are and what we need to do with them and are we doing the right thing. And so I thought before we really just kind of get started with all of that, that I might just give you a little simple word here about, about pleasing the Lord and about what it is that God looks for. Have you ever thought about that? What, what, what is it that would please the Lord? What does God want from our lives? It, it, for pastors, and of course I've been one all my life, so uh, it's hard to think without thinking like a pastor does. But for pastors, it's things like your church, you know. I mean, is your church doing well? Uh, is, it the, is it big enough? Is it growing? Is it reaching people? Is it, uh, is it giving enough to missions? You know, I mean, there are just lots of things that can pop in your mind as to what would be successful a, as a pastor it, to the Lord. And as a church member, and I know, you know, we have all kinds of things that occupy our minds and thoughts, but... We think about things, maybe even things as superfluous as, uh, you know, uh, am I, uh, do people like me? Uh, am, I, am I on the right committee? Uh, do, people, do people respect my position? Uh, do I give enough? Uh, I mean, there are all kinds of things that we can be thinking about to say, well, do I please the Lord? Is, this, is God happy with me? Do do I need to change things? Is there, what, would, what, what do I need to do? And, and to this, I want to read a passage that may seem a little bit out of place because it's really around Easter when this happens. And it's in the, uh, the Gospel of Mark. By the way, it is also in the Gospel of John, chapter 12. It is also in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26. So this is one of those, uh, this is one of those events that Jesus well marks because in three of the Gospels, there, there's information and, there, and there's the call to this attention. And, um, and, and I just want you to know that in, in the Gospels many times, and, and I know that you've read the Scripture and you're familiar with this concept, but, but in the Scripture, uh, the Gospels, we have at the beginning of our New Testament a little section that we call the Gospels. And it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And as we read the Gospels, many times we read some of the same events happening. Quite often, it's not the same event. They, they have been inspired by the Holy Spirit. I believe all the Word of God is inspired by the Holy Spirit. And so the, what the Holy Spirit draws out of one of, the, one of the guys, Matthew, might be a little different perspective than he draws out of another servant, um, John Mark, or, or basically Simon Peter through John Mark. And, and then John sees things and, and writes them in, a, in, in really a basically whole different format than Matthew, Mark, and Luke write them. 
And not to get too technical or theological about them, but uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called synoptic gospels. Um, if you want to impress your friends and influence people, you'll remember that word, synoptic gospel. <laughs> synoptic means uh, to see the same as, to see similar. To, to, to sin meaning alike or similar, and optic meaning to see. So the synoptic gospels see things similarly. Matthew, Mark, and Luke see things similarly. John, on the other hand, is a gospel, but he doesn't see things at all like Matthew, Mark, and Luke do. As a matter of fact, John only records seven of the miracles that, John, that Jesus does, and they're pretty big miracles. And John says, I do this because I want to I show you some things about Christ so that seeing these things about Christ, you'll know he's the Son of God. And knowing that he's the Son of God, you might have life through his name when you believe on him. And at the end of his gospel, John says, you know, I suppose if everything was written about Jesus that could be written, it would fill all the libraries of the world. This world would not be big enough to contain all the books that could be written about Jesus. So in, for an event to be shared in three of these gospels is a tremendous thing. It, it, it's something obviously God wants us to see. And, and we're going to go with Mark. Just uh, it, it has a few details, and John had, might have a detail or two that Mark doesn't have, and Matthew might have a little detail or two, but they're all the same story. And let's read. After, after two days, it was the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Everybody say, we're close to Easter. All right, we're close, to the, we're close to the crucifixion of Christ. I mean, we're just days before Jesus is placed on a cross here. And so, and the chief priest and the scribes sought how they might take him by trickery and put him to death. But they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar of the people. All right, we can't take him now because, you know, the people have this religious stuff going on. And if we take their religious person away from them, they're going to riot and have a mob and all of that. So let's just kind of cool it right now. And so here's Jesus and being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, one of, one of his followers there at Bethany. And they, they uh, entertained quite often. They were with each other quite often. Uh, the followers of Christ were like a, like a small group of people that really uh, related to each other, associated with each other, ate with each other, had, had uh, involvement with each other's lives. And so here they are. And, and, and as he sat at the table... A woman came having an alabaster flask of very costly oil and spikenard. Then she broke the flask and she poured it on his head. But there were some who were indignant among themselves and says, Why was this fragrant oil wasted? For it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii. Everybody say 60 bucks. And I know that doesn't sound like a whole lot either, but in these days that was a, a year's wages. A year. A year wages. <laughs> okay, so she takes this this expensive oil and she and she breaks it and it's worth and 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 she begins to be criticized and we could have sold that thing and given it to the poor and they criticized her sharply, but Jesus said, "Let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work on me, for you have the poor with you always, and whenever you wish, you may do them good, but me." You do not have always. She has done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial for her. So here's Jesus, and Jesus is at the home of Simon the leper, and everybody's there. Lazarus is there, and of course you know the story of Lazarus. Lazarus is really amazing, everyone, because who doesn't want to see somebody who's been resurrected from the dead? And he's like the star of the show, really. He's the one that everybody has come to see and talk to, and he's friendly and nice and amazing and wonderful, and all of the people are just uh, so in awe of a man that has been resurrected from the dead. And then here is Martha, Lazarus's sister. You know, she's the oldest sister. She's the one who basically gets most of the headlines in the family because she's wonderful at serving people. She's a great hostess. She's a wonderful cook. The Bible uh, talks about Mary and Martha, and 
Martha never asked Mary to cook anything. So you can assume by that that Martha doesn't think Mary's a very good cook, and she probably wasn't. Uh, it's always talked about as Martha's house. You know, let's go down to Martha's house. Uh, never Mary's house, never Lazarus. It's Martha's house. So she obviously is very well respected and very well thought of, and she's the hostess of hostess, and she can run a party, and man, she can just make sure it all works right, and everybody's full and enjoy it and great. And so Lazarus is there, and he's doing his thing, man. He's, whoo, he's so amazing, so nice, such a great guy. Martha's there. She's stirring in the kitchen, and she's bringing things out for them to eat, and everybody's talking about, man, did you try that spinach casserole or whatever it might be? <laughs> did you try? Did you, did you try that? Did you try that pie, man? Mar, Mar, ooh, she has done, outdone herself. So she's steadily doing the Lord, doing the work. Everybody's doing everything they can, and then all of a sudden, here comes this. Uh, well, in Mark's gospel, unidentified woman. In John's gospel, she's going to be unidentified too. No, in John's gospel, she is. It's the only one that identifies her. It says Mary. It tells us who it is. What I'm saying is that Mary is pretty insignificant, really. I mean, two of the gospel writers didn't even tell you who it was that came and did this. It just said a woman came and broke through the crowd and started doing some stuff. And Don't even, who is that woman? I don't, I don't know. I'm just saying all of that to say that lots of times we can feel insignificant. You know, we can feel that everybody does the right things and everybody has their job and everybody does what they do and they're so wonderful. And I wish I could do stuff like that. I wish, boy, I wish I could just be like Martha or I wish I could be like Lazarus or some of these other guys. Simon makes his house available and you may feel as insignificant as Mary feels here with nothing that she can do. She's not a great cook. She's not a great hostess. She doesn't have a wonderful story to tell about how amazing things have happened in her life and that Jesus rescued her and brought her back to life or anything majestic like that. So what can she do? How can she serve the Lord? What would please God that she could do in life? Well, according to Jesus in this passage, when she did what she did with this alabaster flask of oil, everybody begins to criticize her, or many people there begin to criticize her, because the circumstances here are not favorable for her to inject herself into this situation. You are familiar that in these days, women just didn't do things like this. They were quiet. They stayed back out of the way. They did not uh, intrude into occasions such as this. This was a, this was a, this was a, a man's party. This was a, this was a social event. And the women just didn't, they weren't bold that way. They weren't, they weren't, they didn't, put themselves forward. So the circumstances were awkward. This would not be the time to try to start a new ministry in life. It was like, like no. So in spite of the circumstances, the awkwardness, the, the fear of being out of place, uh, people talk about you. Oh, Mary, you shouldn't have done that. I mean, this, is, this, would be, this would take them aback, you know. And in spite of the criticism, because there were people that began to criticize her immediately when she did what she did. Immediately, I, I'm sure no sooner had she gotten the ointment out of the, out of the flask. It was probably still dripping from the flask when when some people began to criticize her for what she did. 
I mean, the thing hadn't even cooled off yet, and people are beginning to uh, insinuate that she was not a, a good uh, uh, minister. She did not appropriately use the resources that she had in order to do the best that she could with it, that she had made this terrible mistake, and that she could have thought a little bit more about what she was doing and made a better choice than what she made. And, not, and it wasn't just anybody that began to criticize her. It was, it was one of the disciples. It was a matter of fact, it was the treasurer of the disciple group, Judas himself. The one that really never called Jesus Lord. I don't know if you've ever noticed that in the gospel. He really doesn't. He, he, never, he, never, he never worships. He never calls Jesus Lord. But, he, but here he is criticizing now somebody else who is worshiping and, and pouring themselves out on Christ. And so in spite of, the, in spite of the, the, the criticism, in spite of the conditions that were there, here comes Mary. And then Jesus looks at her and Jesus says, you leave her alone. She has wrought a good work on me. And she's done what she could. She's come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. Now, this is a, a little unique thought, uh, just so you'll know the difference. Uh, there, were, there were many types of anointings that people would give. There were anointings of, of uh, welcome, so to speak. Uh, you come to my home, and you're welcome. Well, I might anoint you with, with, a, with a typical uh, greeting, welcoming type of anointing. Or if I want to honor you. There's, a, there's an anointing for honoring someone. But according to the word, Mary didn't anoint Jesus as a greeting, and she didn't anoint Jesus as an honor. She anointed him for burial, which was a whole deeper type of anointing. And Jesus said, she's done what she good. You, you leave her alone. She's wrought a good work on me. Have you ever thought about what it is that pleases the Lord? Yeah, I mean, you know, all right, if I give enough money, will that please the Lord? If I build a big building and people come and fill it up, will that please the Lord? When, 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 when I stand up here and I play an instrument and I, and I pour out my praise on that instrument, I mean, does that please the Lord? When I sing a wonderful song, I have a beautiful voice, does that please the Lord? And do you sit there many times thinking to yourself, I wish I could do something that would please the Lord? Because God surely must be pleased with the sacrifices that that one makes, but I don't have anything to give to Jesus. What is it that pleases the Lord? And a better question, do you want to know? <laughs> do you really want to ask him? <laughs> I don't know if you guys notice this, but every once in a while I'll, glow, I'll, I'll, I'll glance over here at Tanya during the message. Have y'all ever seen me do that? I don't, I, sometimes I don't do it. You know why I don't do it? Because I don't want to know what she has to think about. Because I know some reason or another I've bungled something or messed something up or it's confusing or something. I, don't, I just don't even want to look over that way. I don't want to see what, because I don't really want to know <laughs> what she thinks about it. Every time I think about whether you want to know and, and, and how you please some, the, the right one, I think about the, the concert pianist, and uh, forgive me if, if I've said this so much, you, you guys can know what I'm saying, but know what I, know what I get to before I get to the end. Uh, but this piano student was giving his first recital at Carnegie Hall. Great time, had done wonderfully. He does the concert, everything's beautiful, great. Everybody's cheering, standing on their seats and cheering, and he goes off the stage, and his manager's back there and says, hey, you know, they loved you. Go back out and do an encore, you know. Go, they want you to come back. And, and he shakes his head. And why, man? He said, they, everybody loves you. And the guy says, well, not everybody. And he said, what are you talking about? And the guy points to the, in the balcony. There's this old man, and he's sitting down. He's not clapping. He's not standing up cheering. He's, he's just sitting there. And the manager looks at him and says, that old man? What's one old man? And the guy says, that, that's my teacher. 
I don't always want to know what Jesus would might what Jesus might think about what I'm doing. You know, the Bible says that when Jesus resurrected from the grave, he went to heaven, he sprinkled his blood on the mercy seat of God, and then he sat down at the right hand of God the Father. When he sat down, you know what that meant, right? It meant my work's finished. And that's where Jesus was. And in the book of Acts, now this is an unusual thing, in the book of Acts, there was a deacon named Stephen. And he was ministering the gospel. Brand new church just started. I mean, church brand new. Just really the, the infant beginnings of the church. And, and Philip is serving the Lord and he's doing all kinds of things. And, 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 and some people get him and they stone him to death. And when they stone him to death... The scripture says that Jesus stood up to welcome Stephen. In other words, Jesus, who had sat down beside the right hand of the Father, was so impressed with what Stephen did that Jesus himself stood up and welcomed Stephen home. I think many times, could I please the Lord this way? Wouldn't it be wonderful that, it, it, that Jesus would stand up in honor of, how, of your service or your sacrifice or your worship or whatever it might be? Man, that would be an awesome thing. Well, what would it take to please Jesus this way? Could anybody do it? Could you do it? I mean, do you have to be a preacher and preach great messages or a singer and do beautiful songs or a writer and write tremendous words or a teacher and teach tremendous things or, or a giver and give great sums of money or a builder and build giant church buildings and, and put them on all over the world? I mean, is, is this what it takes to please the Lord? Is this what it would take for Jesus to stand, <laughs> to stand for you and go, hey, babe, I like what you did and I like the way you did it. Well, according to him, in this passage, the answer is uh, no. Anybody can do this. We all can do this. This Christmas season, when you're watching those specials, you're watching those big churches and those big people and those big bands and those big uh, talented groups and people get up there and just blow you away with the awesome anointing of God on their lives. And you're sitting there feeling so insignificant, so tiny, like, I'm not, I'm not, you know. Maybe the Lord can bring some of this thought back to you because Jesus says here, um, I'm going to share with you what you need to do to please me because I want you to know that you can do this. Now, let me, let me give you the first thing on your outline, all right? I know you're interested in this outline. First, here's the first thing. Do what, and I'm going to stress it like I want it, you to remember it. Do what you can. Do what you can. Here is Mary she can't cook, she can't serve, she can't amaze, she can't impress. What can she do? Oh, I remember, I've got some ointment that I have been saving my whole life to be used when, when, when my body's gone. They're going to take this ointment that I have hidden back here in the closet and they're going to anoint me and anoint my body because that's what you're supposed to do. That's appropriate and that's good. And she had been saving it all this time. And all of a sudden, evidently, into her mind pops, I've got some ointment. And she goes and she gets this ointment. And the Bible says that, that it's in an alabaster flask. And she brings this flask out. And she breaks the cap of it off or the top of it off. And she begins to pour it on Jesus. So she can't preach, she can't sing, she can't serve, she can't impress, she can't blow people away, but she can 
anoint him out of love for Jesus. A simple act that anyone can do. Here's Mary doing what she can do. In the book of 1 Corinthians, the Bible makes it very clear in chapter 3 that we are all going to stand before the Lord one day as children of God. There is a judgment seat for the children of God. Now, it's not the great white throne that is at the end in the book of Revelation where all of the dead, everybody say spiritually, spiritually. all of the lost people, all of the ones who have never come to Christ, whose names are not written in the book of life, they will all stand at a great white throne one day at the end of everything. You and I, however, as children of God, will stand before God one day, but we'll not be judged as to whether we are lost or saved, but we will be judged as to what we did with what God gave us. The Bible says that no fountain, now this is in 1 Corinthians 3, you can read it. The Bible says, no other foundation can be laid in your life that'll get you to heaven except one. And that is the foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ. But on that foundation, you can build a life. And you can build a life that is either wood, hay, and stubble, or gold, silver, and precious stones. And when you stand before the fiery judgment seat of Christ, the fire will judge every man's work of what sort it is. Not how long it is. Not how big it is. Not how valuable it is. But of what sort it is. This just simply means my life and my works are going to be judged by the fiery judgment seat of Christ. And if I've built a life of wood, hay, and stubble, it says my, that's going to be burnt up at the judgment seat, and I will receive no reward for that. But if my life is gold, silver, and precious stones, it will survive the fiery judgment seat, and it will rise up, and I'll receive a reward for a life of gold, silver, and precious stones. What is a life of wood, hay, and stubble? A life of wood, hay, and stubble is a life that's lived with ulterior motives other than pleasing Christ, serving God, being humble, real. Uh, the fruit of the Spirit pops into my mind. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control, that kind of life. That's wood, hay, and stubble. Things I do for pride, things I do for uh, respect, things I do for notoriety, things I do because I want people to brag on me or talk of nice about me or look at me in a higher way. Things I do to, to, to make myself happy, to please myself. Uh, all of that's wood, hay, and stubble. But we are going to stand before the Lord one day and he's going to look at us and he's going to say, what did you do with what I gave you to do with? Not what did you do that, that was like Pastor Keith or like, or like uh, some other person you might know as a, as a Christian and you might say, boy, I wish I could do some of those things. No, 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 no. What, what, did, what did you do with what he gave you to do with? That's the thing. Jesus said, you leave her alone because she has wrought a good work on me. To me, that just simply says, if you want to know what pleases God, what pleases God is, what do you do uh, as a service to him? I mean, I know, look, I know we all think about each other and we think, man, I need to help mankind and I need to worry about the poor and I need to get, take care of everybody in the church and I need to worry about my brother and I need to pray for this. And, I need, and, and everything we think has other people involved in it. As if somehow what pleases God is if we just focus ourselves on other people. But that's not what Jesus said. Jesus didn't say, hey, this is going to be a testimony for her forever because she took such good care of all those people there. He just says, the, the thing that impressed me is that she wrought a good work on me. She broke her alabaster flask and poured it on me. So breaking your life and pouring it on Christ 
is doing what you can do. One other little quick thought here. Just a second. Let me, let me get to it. Do all you can. Do what you can. Secondly, do all you can. Now, by this, I'm just simply saying that what Mary did was a complete gift to God. There was no plan B. She goes back and gets the flask. She brings the flask out. She does not screw the cap off and pour a little bit and then put the cap back on. As if, all right, I'm going to give him a little bit and then I'm going to save the rest of this, which I'm sure he will not mind. And I'm going to save the rest of this for myself. No, she was totally involved with this thing. And what she did was a total gift of everything that she had to offer. When she broke that flask uh, there was no recapturing this thing. There was no putting the toothpaste back in the tube. You know, there was, there, it, was, it was over. It was all poured out on him. So what pleases God that we would do what we could do and that we would do all that we could do, that we would not reserve anything that I would break my alabaster flask and that I would pour myself on Christ and that I would pour all of myself on Christ. Not the Sunday part of me only. Not the, not the, not the uh, celebration part of me only. Not the sentimental side of me only. But that I would pour all of me on Christ. You see, we come in every Sunday... We come into the sanctuary of the Lord every Sunday in all of our little alabaster vases. Our, our lives, our emotions, our spirits, our praise, our worship, our service, our desire, we're all like a bunch of, of alabaster vases sitting out here in all of these seats and we're all in our separate little flask waiting for the Spirit of God so that we can be broken and, and poured out on him. All of it. All of our life, that's what he wants. And let me give you this last one because I can see, all right, here we go. Do all that you can do. Do what you can do. Do all that you can do. And then here's the last one. This is really deep. Do it now. Do it now. Look at your neighbor and say, do it now. Do it now. All right. We're always waiting, right? We're always planning to do something. Well, you know, when we get to this, this point, then I'll, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to really pour myself. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give of myself. I'm, gonna, I'm really going to do it. And we're always waiting. And, and, and what I want to show you here is that Mary pours this ointment on Jesus and and Jesus says in the passage that she anoints him for the burial. Are you aware that Mary here is the only person that ever anointed Jesus? The women were coming to anoint him after he was crucified. You remember? They were coming and they were getting there before the sun even rose on the very first day that they would be allowed to be in the presence of a dead body, they were running. They were, they were going to the tomb and they had oils and ointments and spikenard and they had all of the fragrance because they were going to anoint the body of Jesus because nobody had time to anoint the body because it was Passover day and they had to take him off the cross and hurry to get him in a tomb because he couldn't be out of the tomb on Passover day. So nobody had time to anoint his body. Nobody had time to pour oil or ointment on Jesus. And so when they were coming to anoint him early in the morning, when they got there, the stone was rolled away and the angel said, why are you looking for the living among the dead? He's not here. He's risen, just like he said he was going to do. 
and you go back and tell the disciples and Peter to meet him in Jerusalem just like he told you to. They never got to anoint the body of Jesus. The only person that ever anointed Jesus was somebody that did it before he was crucified. And the Bible says that when she did it, she anointed him. Jesus said, for my burial. Identifying the fact that there was a time coming when I'm going to be gone. And if you're going to do anything for me, you got to do it now. I won't be here later. I'll be here now. And if you're going to do it, you got to do it now. He says, the poor you're going to have with you always. Judas jumps up and criticizes her for wasting this ointment because it could have been sold. Now, John's gospel tells you what was on his mind. John's gospel said, this he said, not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And he held the money bag. And he stole money from the bag. And so he criticizes, and Jesus said, you leave her alone. This, has, this is done now, and this is going to be done, and nobody else is going to do this but her. So this simple act, simple act of pure love and devotion, no big program, no big uh, uh, skills, uh, no tremendous effort, simply a love for God, and a heart to pour ourselves out on him. One interesting little thought about this, about what happens here, is Mark says she poured the oil on his head. John says it was on his feet and that she wiped his feet with her hair. So what happens is she anoints him on his head and it runs down his body and drips off of his head onto his feet and Mary's down with her hair and she's wiping the ointment off of Jesus' feet. Which I think is a wonderful picture. Now watch this. Yeah, humility would obviously be there. But, but listen to this. All right. When you pour something on Jesus. The, free, this, the, the fragrance that she poured on Jesus ran down Jesus and then she wipes it with her hair. So what she poured on Jesus ends up back on her. That sweet smelling fragrance that when she broke that bottle and started to pour that ointment that filled that room now came back on her. What does that mean? Well, we're talking about Christmas. How many of you, when you were growing up, as children, obviously you didn't have any resources or any money, and it came Christmas, and you loved Mama or Daddy, and you had no money, and you wanted to desperately to get them some little something token for Christmas, and so what generally happened? Generally, Mom or Dad gave you a little money, and you went running with your little money, and you found something that you thought would be wonderful for them. And then you would wrap it up and put a little tag on it and said, To Mama from Keith. Now, that gift that I gave to my mama was bought with the money that came from my mama. In other words, I took my mother's money and bought my mother something and said, This is from me. Now think about that. God has given us everything. The only thing God asks us to give is something that he's already given to us. So when we give ourselves to him, all we're doing is giving back to him something that he's already paid for. And what it requires from us is breaking our alabaster flask. You have one. It might be pride that needs to be broken so you can be poured out. It might be money. It might be prestige. It, it, 
It could be a job. It could be a child. Uh, Abraham had an alabaster box whose name was Isaac. God said, take your alabaster box up to the mountain and sacrifice him. And Abraham took some wood and he took some fire and he took his little alabaster box walking beside him. That little box that was going to have to be broken and poured out so that, they, so that God could have all of Abraham. For God to have all of you, your alabaster box has to be broken. And God took him up and Abraham took him on the mountain and then laid him on that altar. And just as that knife was starting to plunge down into the little alabaster flask, God stopped him and said, I've seen enough. The little fellow said, we have the wood and we have the fire, but where's the lamb? And Abraham said, don't worry about the lamb, son. God will provide the lamb. God has provided everything for us to please him. In other words, he's not asking you to give something that he didn't first give to you. All he's asking for you to do is give back to him what he's given to you. And then the fragrance that fills him will also fill you in life. So how do I please God? I brought a good work on him. And I've broken my box and I've poured myself on him. And God is pleased. And it says, and because she did this, for, the, for as long as there are hum, human beings on this earth, this testimony is going to be known by every person that ever lives on this earth. And here we are 2,000 some odd years later, and here's Mary's sacrifice being honored one more time as a simple way to encourage us to please the Lord with our lives that he's given.